It is a huge honour for me to stand um, on the platform with Sir Stuart. Um, he was with quite a prestigious family yesterday, as many of you probably know. So to be sharing the same stage as someone who was with the royal family yesterday, thank you for, for coming and joining with us today with IDP. I'm going to hand over to Sir Stuart Etherington. Thank you. <coughs> Elizabeth, thank you very, very much. Yes, you're quite right. It's slightly, slightly less threatening than talking to 10,000 people, the world's media, in front of your sovereign. Uh, but, uh, uh, and you haven't got the right hat for, for that. Um, uh, okay, let me just... Uh, I'm going to fill you out some of the background about why this review happened, and then I'll talk you through uh, what some of the changes uh, that were proposed are. But I'll also talk about some of the things that were in the wind anyway, and the report just confirmed that they were happening, uh, rather than had a specific set of recommendations. So uh, uh, we got a call, I got a call uh, last uh, summer in July from the Minister for Civil Society to lead this review. My, my first piece of advice to you all is if you ever do receive a phone call from a minister uh, saying we'd uh, like you to do this review, could we have it by September, uh, my view would be that your response should be, I'm, I'm going on holiday tomorrow. <laughs> um, what was the background to this? Well, there were several damaging stories, some of which had resonance uh, with the public, and I think this was quite important. These weren't stories that some journalist that wanted to duff up charities was actually writing. It had some resonance with the public. There were principally three stories uh, that were around at the time. Uh, the first, of course, was probably the, the best known, was the tragic story of Olive Cook, who was an elderly lady, uh, who was um, uh, a very generous elderly lady, in fact, was probably why she was getting so many mail shots, uh, who took her own life. Uh, the family uh, denied that this was uh, a fundraiser in response to mass fundraising, uh, but nevertheless, that story stuck, and uh, although the family had said uh, that she was, uh, it wasn't as a result of that. Uh, every time you see a fundraising story now in the newspapers, there is very, very often a, fo a photograph of Olive Cook accompanying that story. So the, the papers really failed to report what the family had said. The second story <coughs> that was out there uh, was a journalist uh, who went undercover in an agency, a Bristol based agency called GoGen. Uh, and uh, was employed by them as a uh, operator. Uh, and she had a, a, a video camera and she had a tape recorder. And what she taped and saw was pretty disgraceful in terms of the pressure that was being put on vulnerable people, often vulnerable people, often elderly people, uh, to increase their level of <coughs> donation. Uh, and this was a real story, and a lot of the public responded to this. So this wasn't something that somehow uh, didn't have any uh, resolution uh, or didn't have any resonance with the public. And the third story was published uh, later, uh, was the story of Mr. Ray. I don't know if you remember this story, but this story uh, was about a man with dementia uh, in Cornwall uh, whose son uh, had, uh, was responding to the many mail shots that he was receiving, not only from the charitable sector, uh, but also from the commercial sector. Uh, and what the journalist did here uh, was to track uh, the data swapping and data selling that had gone on uh, in relation to Mr. Ray's case. Uh, the original data was generated by a lifestyle survey from a charity. Uh, this was not an uncommon way of collecting uh, cold data on individuals. It's a lifestyle survey that then provides you with information. This data had been sold, traded, swapped. Uh, nobody knew how many organisations were mailing Mr Ray because they only had data about what they were doing, not what other people were doing. This is a common problem uh, that no one organisation knows what the collective impact of the sector is because they've been buying, selling, swapping data. Um, this meant Mr. Ray had also got on to what are called suckers lists. This is, uh, uh, those of you, have, have people here know what a suckers list is? A suckers list is where, you know, you really think you have won £25,000 in a competition. Uh, and you are uh, you're ov often vulnerable. Uh, and you fill it all out and you find yourself uh, indebted increasingly to 
uh, particular agencies who certainly haven't given you a prize of £25,000. And Mr Ray ended up on one or two of these suckers lists. The issue wasn't that the charities sold this data to the suckers list, but had sold, swapped. Nobody knew who owned this data in the end. So these were three specific stories that led to uh, uh, the request to, um, for me uh, and three peers, uh, Lord Lee, who was a Conservative, uh, Lord Wallace, who was a Liberal Democrat, and Baroness McKeithley, who was a Labour peer, uh, to actually conduct this investigation, also with a, a team, some of my staff and some Cabinet Office staff, Help. The review was fairly short, fairly quick. We reported by September. Um, in retrospect, I would have liked slightly longer to look at the cumulative effects of, the, uh, of what we were doing and to test some of the assumptions that we made, but that wasn't a, a luxury uh, that we had. And our key aim was to address the relationship between the fundraising sector and the public and to try and restore public trust and confidence in fundraising. Uh, as a whole. Um, and we were also keen to avoid statutory regulation. Uh, I think the Minister was under some pressure to introduce statutory regulation. This is common uh, if, there's a main, if there's a public policy issue uh, that emerges uh, and really catches uh, the public uh, and the media is, is often a reaction which is to regulate. Uh, the Dangerous Dogs Act being probably the most uh, uh, extreme example of that. But there's a desire, to, statutory regulation is something governments turn to quite a lot and fairly quickly. So we were quite keen to avoid <coughs> statutory regulation and instead uh, we went for co-regulation and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. <coughs> the key principles of our thinking uh, when we set out this task was that fundraising is a critical and necessary way to help organisations do their work, whether it's delivering overseas development or building an, a new school playground. So whatever it is, fundraising is critical to be able to develop that. But equally important, and this was a strong theme in what we uh, developed, uh, it must be clear that however important that the ends are, it doesn't justify the use of any means. And time and time again, we, we were, when we were talking to charities, they were saying, ah, yes, but look at the great things we do with the money. And that's fine and, and, and proper, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, that doesn't justify doing anything to raise the money. <coughs> uh, and we wanted to move to a situation where uh, organisations viewed donors as long-term partners not short-term opportunities to be exploited. And more and more, I visited some agencies as part of this, because agencies were one of the stories where charities contract out some of this work. Uh, and when they ring you, <coughs> they don't say, hello, this is GoGen, can I have some money? They say, I'm speaking on behalf of whoever it is, the NSPCC, whatever, whatever, whoever it is. Um, and a lot of it was short-term, a lot of it was trying to increase the level of monthly donations by saying to people that that's what they wanted uh, to do. <coughs> so what did we uh, recommend and why did we recommend it? Uh, well, the first uh, recommendation uh, were essentially, there was, they were institutional recommendations. Uh, we found that the existing system was far too complicated with far too many different bodies covering <coughs> the same territory. So you had three principal organisations involved. The Institute of Fundraising, uh, the, uh, which was the professional association of fundraisers who owned the Code of Fundraising Practice, uh, which sets out the rules for fundraisers. Uh, the Public Fundraising Association, it, which was in charge of face-to-face -face fundraising, uh, had the dual role of a membership and a regulatory body. And the Fundraising Standards Board, which was, had been set up as a membership body, uh, which was essentially the main regulator and adjudicator, but based on membership. You can immediately see the flaw in that particular area. If you're regulating somebody who are essentially your members, we've got 12,000 members, uh, I'm not about to expel them. Uh, and so the fundraising regulator had a, fun, fun, a, a funding model 
which, uh, which meant that it was less likely uh, to be critical uh, of its members. And what we agreed that tinkering around the edges wouldn't be sufficient and that this was the last opportunity for the sector to come forward with proposals for a new system. I'll tell you now that there had been five, uh, four previous attempts to reform fundraising regulation, all of which had in fact failed. Uh, and this was, as somebody said in the House of Lords in relation to this review, it was the last chance of the last chance of the last chance saloon. So unless, unless people went along with this, the alternative is statutory regulation, <coughs> which we were trying to avoid. So what was the recommendation? Well, the first was to establish a new fundraising regulator to replace the Fundraising Standards Board. And that's now been established. Uh, it's chaired by Lord Grade, Michael Grade, and the Chief Executive is Stephen Dunmore, and they're busy now establishing themselves and will launch in July. Uh, the FRSB had some achievements to its name. It had shown, I think, insufficient effectiveness in dealing with the major ethical and cultural issues that last summer's events had raised. Uh, the FRSB had lost the confidence of Parliament, it had lost the confidence of the government and the public, all of whom support was essential if self-regulation was to succeed. Crucially, the FRSB had lost, if it had ever had, the supports of the charitable sector. So we wanted to simplify the regulatory landscape. Uh, we, we proposed a merger of the Institute of Fundraising and the PFRA, essentially reducing it to two bodies, a regulatory body and a professional body. That's what we wanted to achieve. Uh, helpfully, the IOF and the PFRA have agreed to merge and they're now heavily involved in merger uh, discussions and we expect that to happen shortly. Uh, shift towards co-regulation, which I mentioned, where which the fundraising regulator would work in close cooperation with the Charity Commission <coughs> Uh, for charities and other relevant statutory regulators such as HEFGE for uh, universities. The statutory regulator would act as an additional backstop in cases that raise regulatory concerns or issues that fall within its remit. Let me give you an example. Let us say that the fundraising regulator persistently had told a particular charity or organisation to cease doing a particular activity until they were been able to demonstrate that they were doing it effectively, some form of direct mail or whatever the fundraising technique was, but they persistently refused to go along with what the self-regulatory body says. We would view that, or we in this report would suggest that uh, this would be a failure of governance because they had failed to take account of the, what the, the voluntary regulator, the self-regulator had said, and that would then be a cause for concern for the statutory regulator, who has far more draconian powers uh, than we were proposing for the self-regulatory body. It can remove trustees, essentially, uh, and replace them. Uh, so what about the new fundraising regulator? We gave it some additional powers that weren't for the FRSB. So uh, firstly, it would have the public interest at its heart. It's there, as we know. Regulators are there to represent the public interest. Uh, it would have a universal remit, this was new, uh, that it would, uh, uh, all organisations that carry out funding, uh, fundraising activities would be subject to its regulatory powers. It would have increased powers, uh, including the ability to proactively investigate, regardless on, of whether an individual had made a complaint. It was going to have tough, we proposed, and it will have tougher sanctions. Uh, including the power to name and shame, uh, and require charities to cease fundraising campaigns if they had serious problems with it. Uh, we didn't include, uh, some asked us, we didn't include the power to fine. Uh, the reason uh, we didn't include that is uh, the two observations about that. Uh, the first is who are we exactly are we fining in this case? Of course, we're fining the very donors that uh, might have been impacted by this. It would be their money, uh, nine times out of ten, that was being used to pay the fine. The other thing uh, uh, that causes problems in relation to fining is that you find, and this would probably be, whether it would be the case amongst larger charities, I'm not sure, uh, it's certainly the case in banking, uh, where they do fine quite heavily, uh, 
uh, much to the advantage of some charities when they get the LIBOR money, but uh, um, uh, it, people build it into their business model. <coughs> they assume that they're going to, that they might have to pay a fine. Uh, and therefore, they build that fine into their pricing and business models. So I'm not sure that fining, sometimes it works. Uh, and of course, the other key player in relation to this whole area, particularly in relation to direct marketing, is the information commissioner, uh, who uh, does have a bad fine. Uh, and we'll come on to him maybe in Q&A, because he's the other, uh, or now she, actually. Uh, it was he, it's now she. Uh, will have the will be significant in relation to this regulatory regime. It's not only the fundraising regulator; the information commissioner is, in some ways, more important in direct marketing uh, than anybody else. Uh, so uh, we uh, also uh, introduced the notion of probably the most controversial thing that we suggested uh, was the fundraising preference service. Uh, which was an attempt really to deal with the most vulnerable. Uh, it was an attempt to deal with the Mr. Ray problem that I, I identified before, which was that no one charity would know all the mail shots that was hitting Olive Cook or Mr. Ray, uh, and uh, therefore they or their relatives, guardians, uh, would have the ability to switch that off. Uh, it's controversial. Um, and it would be funded, the regulator, by a payment of a levy based on fundraising exp expenditure. Uh, so no longer a membership fee, but a levy uh, based on how much you spend on fundraising. Uh, but of course, uh, strengthening the regulatory framework, which is what all that was about, including uh, that, um, uh, that set of recommendations, uh, was only really part of the picture. Uh, regulatory frameworks are regulatory frameworks. People don't only do things because of what regulatory frameworks tell them to do. We were trying to point to the need for a cultural change amongst some charities who had ceased to see their donors as long-term supporters of the cause and saw them more uh, as a series of consumers or customers where it was important to push <coughs> Uh, for as much money as you can. Um, it was used and seen purely as a money-raking mechanism, uh, I think losing sight sometimes of the donors' interests and the organization's ethos. Needed to move beyond regulation, in a sense, and compliance from simply just doing things right to also doing the right thing naturally as part of the culture that you would have. It should be, of course, about building a relationship with your donors and supporters and respecting their preferences and communicating with, with, with them how and, when, uh, how and when they wish. Um, the other area uh, which uh, was in the report, it wasn't something that we were recommending, but we were flagging uh, in relation to the future, 2018, was the European directives in relation to opt-in, uh, which means that you have to have consent for people to receive uh, mail shots, telephone calls, whatever, from you. Uh, and this will become uh, law in 2018. It will be enforced by the Information Commissioner. And I've said all along, since the report was published, it represents a more fundamental shift than, say, the fundraising preference service or the changes in the self-regulation of fundraising. It is a significant shift in relation to the balance between the asker <coughs> and the giver. It's about consumer, if you like, protection. This doesn't only apply to charities, of course. It apply, uh, applies to the private sector as well. So what does that mean for you? And I guess uh, uh, I'm not an expert in the work, fundraising work that you do, uh, but the relationship your schools have with their alumni and parents, of course, is a very important one. I think the changes to the regulatory landscape won't affect that, the nature of that relationship. On the contrary, I think better <coughs> regulation will engender a greater sense of trust in fundraising generally, benefiting you as fundraisers specifically. But ultimately, whether fundraisers are happening to support Macmillan Cancer Services or your school's development, it consists of appealing to individuals' generosity and support. Uh, 
This activity has to be done, I think, in compliance with the law and with good practice. You are part of a fundraising system, and as such, it's appropriate that you come within the regulatory framework. Throughout the review, I think we've been very clear that fundraisers need to be able to ask in order to receive the donations and support that allow them, the, the organisations for which they work, to carry on the incredible, valuable things that they do. But we've also been clear that worthwhile ends do not justify any means being deployed. It is wrong in principle for people to be pressured into giving, whether this is through repeated letters and phone calls or being approached too many times in the street. People shouldn't be, not be surprised about hearing from you. They should want to hear from you. It's difficult to predict the exact financial consequences will be, but we have to acknowledge there will be possibly be a short-term dip in donations as we move to models that are more sustainable in the long term. This, as I've said, will be compounded by the changes that will be introduced by the EU reform of data protection with the requirement that consent must be freely given specific, informed, and unambiguous. Those are important words, so I'll repeat them. The, uh, the consent must be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. So, for example, if you're into text donating, uh, and you say text five pounds, and you text five pounds for an appeal of some description, that is not, it's freely given, it's, not, it's, it's specific for that appeal, uh, it's informed and unambiguous, is it? Uh, it's specific to that appeal. What that means is that text donation of five pounds does not constitute uh, for the charity uh, the view that those donors then would like to hear from you forever. It means they've given you five pounds for a particular appeal. These will create challenges for all of us. Uh, and undoubtedly, there are big challenges ahead. My own view is that this dip will be followed by a slow but sure increase in levels of donations. And those donations will be given by people who want to hear from you. You're likely to get more reliable, probably higher value donations. And a lot of charities won't waste money mailing and ringing people who don't want to hear from them. It's likely in the short term, as I say, that these changes will have an impact on fundraising income, and that's a concern that we all share. But the bigger danger, I think, is that we allow poor practices to continue and that the public's confidence in fundraising declines. That would lead to a significant, I think, and sustained drop in donations across the spectrum. So we hope, I think, we hope that the effect will be minimal because we trust the generosity of the British public. They will see that your organisations are taking this matter seriously and sorting it out. And that's the sort of action that engenders trust over the longer term. Thank you very much. <laughs>